The Demon Prince goes to the academy after the master class condition. The master class is achieved when one possesses extreme active enhancement of magic body strengthening, to the extent that they can strengthen the object they hold. With that said, we return to the original question. In the end, it is true that the condition is to strengthen the weapon with magic body strengthening, as if knowing the doubts of Ellen and me. Turner clenched her fist. Although rare, there are masters who specialize in close combat techniques. Among them, those who can be called master class are the ones who can do this. She extended her palm filled with magic body strengthening into the air. Curl! The short-lived, flickering blue magical power from her palm gave the assurance that anything it touched would shatter into pieces. This, too, is not merely using the magic body strengthening within for defense but briefly releasing and exploding it making it the pinnacle of magic body strengthening control. Of course, some of them go a step further and directly emit the magic itself. From here on, their paths become completely different. The so-called master class of close combat techniques also applies only to those who have gone far beyond the stage of using magic body strengthening for defense. The training methods of martial artists and sword masters are different. In other words, training to strengthen the weapon one holds with magic body strengthening and pursuing the limit of suing the lim magic body strengthening through martial arts techniques belong to different genres. Ellen tilted her head. Then, did you receive training in both? Turner had demonstrated the techniques used by the masters of martial arts while using the Aura Blade. Her face reddened slightly at the mention of having trained in both completely different paths. Um. No, not really. I've only trained with the sword, of course. I'm familiar with other weapons like spears and bows. But my knowledge of martial arts is relatively, relatively, relatively shallow. Then how did you do that just now? Her face reddened, and she hesitated slightly. When one reaches the extreme in a certain field, understanding of other fields to some extent follows. I am a great grandmaster, so I naturally know how to do things even in fields I'm not familiar with. She struggled to say those words. Thinking about it, Turner had said that she was not used to teaching others. So, even though she was a teacher at the temple, teaching was still a new experience for her. You're amazing. Watching the red-faced Savalyn Turner at Ellen's honest admiration was quite an amusing sight. It's interesting to hear the words I used to hear from my teachers at the temple coming from the mouths of you students know that we're back here. In the end, she let out a bitter laugh and a deep sigh. What I'm trying to say is that you've become familiar with using magic body strengthening for defense, so now it's time to move on to the next step, and whether you're a martial artist or use a weapon, Improving the autonomy of magic body strengthening through training is a common goal. Up until now, they had used magic body strengthening to enhance their physical strength and endurance. However, now they needed to learn how to use magic body strengthening itself offensively. They needed to learn how to transform the magical armor that had protected their bodies into a weapon, like a spear, as they pushed this to the limit. They would eventually reach a level where they could overlay magic body strengthening onto martial arts, and naturally, earn the title of master class. But even if an enemy at the sword master level appears, you won't be able to face them. Those who awaken their magic body strengthening are few, and those who reach the master class are even fewer. Are even few it's unlikely that this moment will come to you any time soon, even though they were special. Becoming a swordmaster in just a few days was impossible. That's why Turner had originally told Ellen, instead of teaching them how to become a swordmaster, she would teach them how to face one. A swordmaster can't be challenged by ordinary people, skilled martial artists, or even those who know how to strengthen themselves with magic body strengthening. It's the same for mages. Most offensive spells will be blocked by their magic body strengthening defenses and spells that could have an effect take too long to cast. Giving the Swordmaster time to either close the distance and kill the mage or escape the spell's reach. No matter how exceptional their talents, they couldn't hope to face a Swordmaster. There's only one best method, she said quietly. Surprise them, she offered advice more fitting for an assassin. No matter how powerful a master class is, they can't maintain their magic body strengthening at all times. 
and there will always be moments when they are vulnerable, they can't always be sensitive to their surroundings. A surprise attack, it was a ruthless strategy, but they had no other choice. The reality of her words was so harsh that they couldn't help but be taken aback. Remember that throughout history, more master class individuals have been assassinated than have died honorably in, 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 in battle. Turner's advice proved to be far more important than they had imagined. Killing through traps, ambushes, or while they slept was more common than in a head-to-head -head battle or on the battlefield. What if we have to face them head-on? At Ellen's question, Turner answered seriously. If that's possible, then run away. She wasn't joking. What if we can't run away? The conversation seemed like a scripted exchange, but it was necessary. If they couldn't run away, did that mean they had to face them head-on? If you can't run away, then surrender. Relying on the enemy's mercy offers a better chance of survival than trying to fight them. And fighting a swordmaster was nearly as bad as surrendering. She wasn't mocking them with her serious expression. She was genuinely discussing what they should do if a master class intent on killing them appeared before their eyes. If a surprise attack isn't possible, a head-on confrontation is forbidden. If one can't even flee, it's better to surrender. What if our opponent is someone who has absolutely no intention of sparing my life? This time, it was my question, from the start. She was telling us not to fight against a master class, surprise attack, escape, surrender, when all other options disappear, and there's no other way but a direct confrontation, what should we do? From now on, I will teach you how to deal with that, but you must not become arrogant thinking that learning this will allow you to defeat a master class. Turner was utterly serious. You cannot kill an elephant with a toothpick. That was obvious. Remember that I'm teaching you this so that you can stab an elephant in the eye with a toothpick and then run away. Of course, even that won't be easy. Just in case, she wants us to survive for as long as possible. We don't know when a battle will come, and we don't know who will target us and from where. So, she said she'd teach us how to deal with situations when we face powerful opponents or tough circumstances. Swordmaster, Archmage, Demon, Devil, Monster, and an army. It's not about winning, it's about confronting. She wanted to teach us how to survive in situations we might face someday. If in the event of encountering a Swordmaster and being forced into a direct confrontation, the way for us to survive, Turner assessed our chances of winning as close to zero saying it would be better for us to surrender. Use obstacles. The senses of a swordmaster surpass those of ordinary humans, but the most reliable sensory organ for humans is vision. Scatter sand or throw large objects to obstruct their view. Somehow, somehow, petty tactics were being suggested. Use noise. After vision, the most important sensory organ is hearing. When vision is blocked, it becomes the most active sense. Alternatively, escaping to a noisy place is another option. Scatter dirt and create a commotion. The advice of a grandmaster seemed too practical, and the thought of actually doing such things was somewhat depressing. Assuming an enclosed space, setting a fire is the best option. Fire provides both visual obstruction due to smoke and noise. Also, breathing is fair to everyone, everyone, everyone. They may be able to hold their breath for a while. But not forever. While heat may not threaten a swordmaster, inhaling smoke is dangerous for them too. She taught us not how to confront, but how to escape. I know it makes sense, but as the hope of humanity, I'm learning to scatter dirt, create a commotion, and set fires. Both Ellen and I had expressions that showed we had no idea what was going on. Turner punched Ellen when she found an opening. But if it had been a real battle, Ellen would have died at that moment. Do not cross swords with it. Do not try to parry it either. Avoid all of its strikes. You must avoid them. It sounded simple. But was it possible? And do not attempt to attack. You won't be able to handle the power within the sword. The moment your weapon touches the enemy, the same thing will happen as if you had clashed with the sword. You must not try to attack either. If you think of it as a mere feint and aim for the enemy's neck, the recoil will twist your wrist or bounce back. In the end, it was all about focusing on escaping and not confronting the enemy. In normal circumstances, yes, 
that's what it means. Tara looks at the two of us as if she has another story to tell. I sent Cliffman and Ludwig away because listening to this story would be useless for them. Of course, it was also to hide the fact that you two are the holders of the relics. A common point, we both possess relics in the form of swords. As you've experienced, Lament was repelled just by clashing with the Ara blade. Yes, if it had been an ordinary sword, it would have shattered just from hitting the flat of the Ara blade. Not the edge, the Ara blade is a powerful weapon in itself with an enchantment that cannot be compared to any magic, unless a sword is made of extremely strong material or protected by potent magic. It is safe to say that there is no sword capable of facing the Aura Blade head one. I see, it's not just about being sharp. Depending on the skill of the Aura Blade user, they can cause a powerful backlash by exploding the power within their sword when the swords collide. Ordinary swords don't just get cut by the edge. They're shattered just by hitting the flat. She alternates her gaze between me and Ellen. Lament and Tiameta are relics. They won't break or chip against the Ara blade. Plus, if you lose them, they are bound to your souls, so you can summon them at any time. That means you can at least meet the basic conditions to fight against the unreasonable power of the Ara blade. Not, 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 not losing your weapon. Unless you have a very powerful magical weapon or a relic, you cannot even exchange blows with a master class. But it's only a matter of enduring it. The moment you try to face the sword directly, a gap will form due to the backlash, and that will be the end. After telling Ellen that, Turner looks at me. Reinhardt, your situation may be different. Different. Assuming you can use time at his divine power, if you overlay your sword with divine power, it will protect you and Tiameta from the Ara Blade's backlash to a great extent. A sword not coated in magic, but enhanced with divine power, and myself. Does this mean that the immense destructive power of the Ara Blade will have less of an impact? Act. I had not faced an Ara Blade myself, but I thought I understood what Turner was saying. Indeed, I could withstand a few rounds against the monstrous attack of Riveria Lance, who had also enhanced his sword with divine power, and twinned with his own. Riveria Lance was not a swordmaster, but I did not think he was inferior to one. After all, even the most common swordmasters are not monsters that can survive a stab to the heart. I could face him partly because of external conditions, but the immense divine power of Tiamata itself had also been a great help. As for dealing with an Ara Blade, I could handle it to some extent. Assuming you can use divine power, you can withstand the sword play of an Ara Blade. And Ellen, yes, with Lament, you can penetrate the magic body strengthening defense of a swordmaster. Of course, the chances of piercing are higher. A sword with the sharpness of an Ara Blade, as if it were an innate passive ability, Ellen cannot control it herself. So using it freely like the all-purpose Ara Blade of Savilin Turner is impossible, however, its sharpness and cutting power are overwhelming. In such a situation, if you two are together, the chances of survival are higher. Tiamata can endure but not kill, Lemon can't endure but can kill, while I endure, Ellen pierces. Without the two of us together, a fight against a master class would be impossible. If you're not together, Reinhardt, you should block the enemy's attack as much as possible, obstruct their view, and then escape after assessing the situation. Helen, the same goes for you. An opponent who is only watching you will not give you an opening. If you try to clumsily pierce their heart, you'll be the one to suffer. So, carefully dodge the enemy's sword and inflict minor wounds, or make them aware that your sword is a threat. The enemy will be flustered, and that will give you time to escape. In the end, Turner's conclusion was not to think about facing a swordmaster if they were not together.